Welcome to Photos and Travel, a show that introduces you to fascinating places around the world. Please welcome our host and tour guide, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Photos and Travel, where we bring the world to your doorstep. Today, we're traveling to the ancient country of Armenia, deep in the heart of the Caucasus Mountains. Armenia is filled with history, religion, and turmoil, but has survived as one of the most beautiful countries in the world. After these messages, we'll be back to explore this interesting part of the world. Thinking promotional to brand your organization? At PP Print, we can help with so much to offer. Just ask, we've got you covered. PP Print, where experience pays off. Pet Value has a fleet of services to help you and your pet live your very best lives. Visit Pet Value Port Perry for all of your pet's needs. Pet Offer. Value, just your ask. Pet, We've got your you covered. Peep. Welcome back. As I mentioned, Armenia's history is second to none. It is where Christianity was first embraced in 301 CE, the first time when Christianity was adopted as an official religion. The country is dotted with beautiful churches, some dating back to the 4th century CE. It lies on the slopes of Mount Ararat, the supposed resting place of Noah's Ark. We begin our journey in Yerevan, the capital and largest city of Armenia, and one of the world's oldest continuously inhabited cities. I met my guide, Lucine, who lives in Yerevan, and we immediately began my tour. Our first stop was the Kafishan Center for the Arts an art museum situated within the beautiful Cascade Complex. It is a multiplex of massive staircases and escalators, ascending up from gardens and pedestrian zones, and adorned with some very interesting sculptures. Yerevan has a population of just over a million inhabitants, and dates back to the 8th century BCE. During Soviet times, Armenia experienced little growth, but Yerevan has undergone major transformation since the early 2000s. Retail outlets such as restaurants, shops, and street cafes, which were rare during Soviet times, have multiplied and much construction is taking place throughout the city. As a result of this construction boom, the majority of the historic buildings were either entirely destroyed or transformed into modern residential buildings throughout the construction. Much land has been set aside for parks, such as Swan Lake seen here, where Armenians enjoy hot summer days. Carpet weaving is both a craft and an art, and Armenian carpet weaving dates back to the 5th century BCE. The oldest carpet in the world is saved at the Hermitage Museum in Russia and was made by the Armenians. Yerevan has been the capital of Armenia since its independence of the First Republic in 1918. Suppressed under Soviet rule, the city is rapidly becoming modernized. Yerevan is known as the Pink City because most of the buildings are made of volcanic rock and have a rose-colored hue. This is Republic Square and is a great example of the stone I referred to. The central town square consists of two segments, an oval roundabout and a trapezoid-shaped section which contains a pool with musical fountains. During the Soviet period, it was called Lenin Square, and a statue of Lenin stood in the center. Soviet parades and celebrations were held twice a year until 1988, and after Armenia's independence, Lenin's statue was removed and the square was renamed. Our next stop was the Matanaderen, famous for being one of the world's richest banks of medieval manuscripts with more than 300,000 archived documents. One of the most prominent landmarks of Yerevan, it is named after Mesrop Mashtots, the inventor of the Armenian alphabet. The original museum was pillaged several times until Eastern Armenia's annexation by the Russian Empire in the early 19th century, which provided a more stable climate for the preservation of the remaining manuscripts. My last stop in this beautiful city, which by the way is more than 2,800 years old, was a visit to the Magarian Carpet Factory, where I saw the process of creating famous Armenian rugs. There were carpets from different regions of Armenia, and many had hidden meanings of elements used in their design. 
For over 100 years, the Magarian family has been producing unique handmade rugs and carpets. They are made from local wool and dyed with local Armenian ingredients, and that is why they last for centuries. The tradition of making rugs in Armenia dates back to pre-Christian times, nearly 30 centuries ago. Most of the work is done with sheep's wool, and each square meter of carpet has 160,000 Armenian double knots. On average, it takes six to nine months to weave a large rug. While in Yerevan, I stayed at the Hyatt Place Hotel, a beautiful property with many Western amenities. I left the Yerevan area and drove to the Lori region to visit a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Hakpat Monastery. This ancient stunning example of Armenian traditional architecture was erected in the 10th century CE. Standing on a hillside, Hakpat beautifully overlooks the Debed River. The location of a monastery in Armenia was chosen in order to give its monks peace and seclusion. This fortified monastery was founded around 976 BCE. The church was finished in 991 and served as the religious headquarters of the area. Most of the religious structures in Armenia are of the cross-winged dome type and have annexes in four corners. Hekpat Monastery is one of the first to incorporate this style of design. The monastery is the final resting place of the rulers from that area and was a major literary center. It maintained rich feudal lands until the monastery properties were confiscated by the Russian Empire in the 19th century. My next stop was picturesque Lake Savan, the jewel of Armenia, and one of the largest high mountainous freshwater lakes in the world. The coastline of Lake Savan is rich with thick woods, white bear steep rocks, mountain steps, and alpine meadows. A visit to the remnants of Savanavank Monastery was fantastic. It included two temples which were constructed from black tuff, a type of rock made of volcanic ash which probably gave the structure its name Savanavank, meaning black monastery. The view from here was simply magnificent. The mountains surround the lake from all sides, and snow tops are seen almost on the entire perimeter and slowly disappear behind the horizon. After visiting some souvenir stalls, the next morning I made my way to the Garni Fortress, the only sacred pagan place dating back to the first century, which survived an aggressive introduction of Christianity in the fourth century. The settlement has an ancient history and is best known for the Hellenistic Garni Temple, which was erected sometime in the 3rd century BCE as a summer residence for the Armenian royal dynasties. Later around the 1st century CE, the fortress of Garni became the last refuge of the king of Armenia, and sadly, he and his family were assassinated by his son-in-law and nephew. The fortress was eventually sacked in 1386. And in 1679, an earthquake devastated the area, destroying the temple. It was reconstructed between 1969 and 1975. I continued on to visit the monastery of Geghard, which contains a number of churches and tombs, most of them cut into the rock, illustrating the very peak of Armenian medieval architecture. The complex of buildings is set into a landscape of great natural beauty, surrounded by towering cliffs at the entrance to the Azad Valley. The monuments included in the property are dated from the 4th to the 13th century. At the early period it was called Monastery of the Cave because of its rock-cut construction. The monastery was founded according to tradition by St. Gregory the Illuminator and was built following the adoption of Christianity as a state religion in Armenia in the beginning of the 4th century CE. 
Armenia plunged into religion in 301 CE when Gregory the Illuminator baptized the royal family, causing a massive search for artifacts and the building of spectacular monasteries along the way. The property is under the ownership of the Armenian Apostolic Holy Church. Notwithstanding the ownership, the monuments are protected by the law of the Republic of Armenia. The monastery was named after the spear used to stab Jesus. The spear was brought to Armenia after the crucifixion and is now housed in the Exmiadzin treasury in the spiritual center of Armenia, which we'll visit a little later on. Pilgrims came to Gaghard mainly to see the sacred spear that touched Christ and was brought to the Caucasus by Jude the Apostle around 70 CE. Over time, Gaghard grew from being a small chapel into a monastic community. The monastery is attested by Armenian historians. In the 8th and 9th century CE, Arab invaders pillaged Gaghart, destroying unique manuscripts, libraries, and burning down multiple religious edifices. Inside the rock-cut Avizan chapel, there is a holy spring that runs into the monastery. Visitors come to drink from the spring, lining up to fill bottles from home to take the holy water with them. My next stop was one that I've been looking forward to for quite some time, and that is the slopes of Mount Ararat, one of the most historical regions on Earth. The mountain has been called by the name Ararat since the Middle Ages, when it began to be identified with descriptions in the Bible as a resting place of Noah's Ark. It is the principal national symbol of Armenia and has been considered a sacred mountain. It is featured prominently in Armenian literature and art and is depicted on the coat of arms of Armenia along with Noah's Ark. Mount Ararat is located on the borders of Armenia, Turkey and Iran and it came under Turkish control during the 1920 Turkish-Armenian War much to the dismay of the Armenians. Relations between Armenia and Turkey are tense, largely due to the systematic mass murder with ethnic cleansing of ethnic Armenians from Turkey by the Ottoman government during World War I. During its invasion of Russian and Persian territory, Ottoman soldiers rounded up, arrested and deported hundreds of Armenian intellectuals and community leaders from Constantinople. During the conflict in 1915, an estimated one million Armenians were massacred. Turkey denies that any crime was committed against the Armenian people. And as of 2020, governments and parliaments of only 32 countries have formally recognized the Armenian genocide. Kor Virup Monastery built on the Armenian plains at the base of Mount Ararat in 642 CE derives its name from Virap Nurkan, which in Armenian means deep dungeon. Kor Virup is one of the most sacred and visited sites in Armenia, primarily due to the legend of St. Gregory the Illuminator, who was imprisoned for 13 years in Kor Virup's dungeon before succeeding in the conversion of the Tsar to Christianity in the first decades of the 4th century CE. The monastery is 8 kilometers from the Turkish border with beautiful views of Mount Ararat and surrounded by vineyards which produce an excellent brandy. It has been recognized globally and Armenia is the only country outside of France allowed to call their product cognac. Visiting Mount Ararat was amazing and much more impressive than I expected. It's hard to believe many of the monasteries we have visited so far date back more than a thousand years. I was also surprised to learn that Armenia was the first country to adopt Christianity as a state religion. Yerevan, the capital, is a very modern metropolis, which would rival any European city, and I was impressed with the restaurants and the boutiques throughout the downtown core. Armenia has a long but very sad history, and has seen more turmoil than most countries. There are currently more Armenians living outside the country than within. After these messages, I will continue to explore the land which was part of the Silk Road.
Don't feel like spending an hour in the grocery store? With PC Express, you don't have to. Simply download the app, choose your groceries, and the staff at Voss's Independent Grocer in Port Perry will have it ready for you to pick up. Come to Voss's, your independent grocer. Welcome back. Visiting Armenia is a constant array of pleasant surprises. The people are friendly and the countryside is spectacular. Due to the turmoil in the past, there are now more than 9 million Armenians living outside the country with only 3 million residing within its borders. Religion plays an integral part in the makeup of the people and visiting age-old churches, most of which are still in impeccable condition, is a real treat. In this segment, we're going to explore an archaeological dig, visit the Holy See of the Armenian Apostolic Church, and ride the longest cable car in the world. I visited the centuries-old complex of Noravank, situated on the ledge of a picturesque valley. It may, however, not be standing today if it were not for the eyes of the representation of God. Built in the 13th century, the monastery is an excellent example of the ornate architecture of the period. The site is comprised of three surviving churches, each decorated in intricate designs and religious reliefs. The sculptor of the grandest portions of Noravank was a man by the name of Momik, who created the artistic stonework that survives today. He also carved a number of uniquely Armenian religious monuments known as Kachkars which usually depict an image of a cross surmounting a circular symbol. For all of its crumbling historic beauty, Noravank almost didn't make it out of the Middle Ages. When the Mongols conquered Armenia in the 13th century, they set about sacking many of the historic temples of the country. According to my guide, Noravank was spared this fate thanks to a relief of God himself depicted with large almond-shaped eyes. This appeasement to the Mongols' Asiatic heritage seemed to calm the horde enough to leave Noravank be. And it's a good thing too, since the existing ruins of the churches are one of the best historic sites in modern Armenia. The Mongols might not have appreciated it much at the time, but Noravank both accents and rivals the natural beauty all around it. Noravank is the burial place of noblemen from the Middle Ages and was founded by Bishop Hovannis in 1205. An earthquake in 1931 destroyed much of the site, including the dome of St. Stephanus. Repairs to the roof and the upper walls of the Sepulcher Church were made in 1948 and a renovation of the entire complex began in the 1980s, but was not completed until 2001. It was reconstructed true to its original shape, including the treacherous staircase on the outside of the main wall. The Noravank Gorge is a massive canyon in all its glory. Winding along the well-maintained road is truly breathtaking with towering canyon walls on both sides. The picturesque countryside is dotted with intriguing caves and it's as if you've been transported to a different dimension. It is in this region that the Ireni Cave was discovered, with some very interesting finds. Along with pottery fragments, metal and stone artifacts, fabric scraps and organic remnants, a shoe was discovered in 2008. What makes this so remarkable is that the shoe dates back 5,500 years. The cave was also used as a ritual hall. Various skulls of young women were discovered and probably reflect ancient ideas about fertility rituals. Clay structures of different sizes and shapes were found in the first of three rooms. The complex includes various food storage pots as well as jars and barrels and surprisingly a wine press with remnants of grapevines and seeds found nearby. A study of centuries-old winemaking in the area suggests that the practice of grape growing has at least a 6,000-year history. 
I was surprised there was no one guarding the archaeological site and wandering anywhere seemed to be okay. I did spend some time looking for the other shoe, without success. As I continued my trek, I skirted along the Armenian border with Azerbaijan, an area known as Nagorno-Karabakh. This area is quite a powder keg, because during the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia granted this part of Armenia to Azerbaijan. Mostly populated by ethnic Armenians, it is landlocked and the only way residents can visit the rest of Azerbaijan is through Turkey or Iran. There is great tension between the two nations with constant skirmishes breaking out along the border regions. The situation is sad because the area is very picturesque and the people are wonderful. My adventure continued to the longest aerial tramway in the world. A sign at the entrance from the Guinness Book of Records confirms the claim. Known as the Wings of Tatav, the cable car is nearly 6 kilometers or 3.5 miles long. The total one-way trip is about 12 minutes, which is at least half an hour shorter than the winding road below. The tramway is built in one section and construction was finished in October of 2010. Flying over the gorge, the aerial tramway cabin reaches its maximum height of 320 meters or 1,000 feet. When the first cabin reaches the Tatev station, the second one arrives at the Halidzor station. After the wings are reloaded, the movement starts again in the opposite direction. Each cabin accommodates 30 passengers and one steward. As you approach the end of the tramway, you arrive at what is locally known as the jewel of medieval Armenian architecture, the Tatev Monastery. The complex is a powerful, impregnable stronghold which towers on a rock. Its remoteness was strategically favorable, as the monastery was both a religious as well as a political center of the region. Standing on the edge of the rock, the monastery takes your breath away. My guide Lucine put it very nicely. Somewhere down below, the river flows in the valley and velvet green hills stand in silence. One of the most unique monuments is a column called Gavazan. This was originally a pagan monument built to line up with Orion's belt on August the 11th, when Armenians used to celebrate the new year. This date is special since Orion's belt is perfectly vertical on this date. When the column was rebuilt in 904, religious figures explained that the three stars of Orion's belt represented the Holy Trinity, though the pagan history was hard to miss. Tatev is one of the most historically significant monasteries in Armenia. Established in the 9th century, it once housed the region's most important universities and is still an active Armenia apostolic house of worship to this day. Its location, atop an isolated basalt plateau, makes it one of the most visually spectacular tourist attractions in the Caucasus. In the 13th and 14th centuries, the monastery prospered. During this time, Tatev University was the largest center of philosophy and science of medieval Armenia, and students studied for an average of seven to eight years. The library held 10,000 manuscripts, all of which were destroyed in a single day during the Mongol invasion in the 13th century. European scholars would have been jealous of the freedoms that Armenian scholars had as they were able to study with relatively little interference from the church. Another interesting fact is that all students have to take chess as a compulsory subject in school. There are even exams for it. Approximately 98% of the country's population is ethnic Armenian. Armenians have a very strong cultural connection to the Armenian Apostolic Church, which, as I mentioned before, is the oldest Christian church in the world. It was founded in the first century CE and in 301 CE became the first branch of Christianity to become a state religion.
In times of danger, residents of the monastery used secret tunnels and passageways that led to the canyon below, maintaining links with the outside world. The monastery is now marginally more famous because it's at the end of the longest cable car line in the world. My final stop in Armenia was a visit to the Mother Sea of Holy Etchmiedzin, the residence of the head of the Armenian Apostolic Church. It is the Armenian equivalent to the Catholic's Holy See in Rome. The original church was built in the early 4th century between 301 and 303. It was arranged and constructed by Armenia's patron saint Gregory the Illuminator following the adoption of Christianity as a state religion. The cathedral was built over a pagan temple, symbolizing the conversion from paganism to Christianity. The core of the current building was built in 483 CE after the cathedral was severely damaged during a Persian invasion. Although never losing its significance, the cathedral subsequently suffered centuries of virtual neglect. In 1441 it was restored as the head of the church and remains as such to this day. Since then, the Mother See of Holy Etchmiedzin has been the administrative headquarters of the Armenian Church. In 1903, the Russian government issued an edict to confiscate the properties of the Armenian Church, including the treasures of Etchmiedzin. Russian policemen and soldiers entered and occupied the cathedral, but due to popular resistance, the edict was cancelled in 1905. There are several relics in the cathedral, including a piece of wood from Noah's Ark, given to Armenia by a Japanese exploration group. There is also one of the most mysterious relics of the Armenian church and a sacred object from the deepest roots of Christianity, the Holy Lance of Kegheart. According to church tradition, the Holy Lance is the spear point used by a Roman soldier during the crucifixion to pierce the side of Jesus and ensure that he was dead. Long associated with the medieval monastery of that name, it is currently housed in the Museum of the Mother See of Holy Etchmiedzin and taken out on rare occasions for public veneration or to be used in the most solemn church ceremonies. The grounds of the complex are well maintained and people visit both to worship or simply stroll through the tranquil gardens of the center of their religion. Etchmiedzin Cathedral isn't the only noteworthy site in the vicinity, as a nearby library houses over 70,000 books. These books, written in 40 different languages, include the first printed Bible in the Armenian language. Also of note is a cross stone built in 1965 that honors victims of the Armenian genocide that took place in the early 20th century. And that concludes our visit to Armenia in the heart of the Caucasus Mountains. Religion is a driving force in most everything the people do, and visiting the well-preserved sites was amazing. The history of the area is second to none, and the devastation the people experienced over time is inconceivable. I visited Armenia in conjunction with Azerbaijan and Georgia, totally different countries, which we're going to visit in later episodes. For photos and travel, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. It's been my pleasure to be your tour guide today, and I look forward to seeing you next time. If you like this program, please click the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. Want to know what's happening in Skugog? News and lifestyle, changes in business, and all the entertainment information you'll ever need. Plus, each edition has a new photos and travel article. Look for your next copy in your mailbox. At the standardnewspaper.ca, 
we try to show you the lighter side of our community workers and shed some light into their work in our community. With human interest stories on how the community gives back and reporting on legislation which affect us all, the Standard News is raising the standard in your community.